I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker today, Jeff Leake. Jeff is Chief Data Officer, Vice President, and Jay Oren Edson, Foundation Chair of Biostatistics at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. Previously, he was a professor of biostatistics and oncology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and co-director of the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab. His group develops statistical methods, software, data resources, and data analyses that help people make sense of massive scale genomic and biomedical data. As the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, he helped to develop massive online open programs that have enrolled more than 8 million individuals and partnered with community-based nonprofits to use data science education for economic and public health development. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and a recipient of the Mortimer Spiegelman Award and Committee of Presidents of Statistical Society's Presidential Award. I actually remember Jeff fondly from his keynote at our StudioConf 2022, so I'm excited to hear him present to you today, Data Trail and its Extensions, How You Can Build a Local Pipeline of Talent for Your Medical Center. Jeff, it's all you. Great, thank you very much. I really appreciate the intro and uh, really appreciate the invitation to speak here today. I'm gonna share a screen and then if somebody can let me know with a thumbs up if it actually appears. Let me see. Good. Okay, great. All right, um, I'm very excited to talk to you here uh, about Data Trail, which is a project that's been a really personal passion project of mine for more than four or five years now, and um, is something that I'm really excited about growing. And so uh, really eager to tell you about what we've been up to and really look for opportunities to collaborate and, and build on what we've already started. And I think I was really inspired by Peter's introduction of showing something that they had just started working on and then it turning into something even better with the use of collaboration from the community. And I really hope that we can do the same sort of thing with Data Trail here. Um, we're at the early, what I still call the early phases of building this. And, and I think it would be an oppor awesome opportunity to collaborate with all of you. Let's see if I can. So I briefly do my disclosures. I'm a founder and board member on a couple of startups that spun out of my group. And I'm a co-developer of Coursera and LeanPub courses. Um, that produce revenue for various universities and institutes I'm a part of. Um, so I just mentioned those. I just wanted to say I'm incredibly excited to be here today. Um, Our Medicine is a conference that I've uh, admired from afar for a long time, and it's just never worked out for me to be able to be a part of it. But I'm excited to be here now, and I, I'm looking forward to actually being a part of the Our Medicine community for a long time going forward, especially in my new role. Before I get started on telling you about everything that uh, we've been up to, I wanted to take a moment to thank all of the people that are part of this project. Um, this is the largest collaboration that I've ever done. Um, it involves university staff, nonprofit collaborators, students, postdocs, administrators, companies, uh, collaborators at multiple institutions. And I wanted to particularly shout out Shannon Ellis and Abuzar Hadavand, who were two postdocs that started this project with me. Um, they took a really big gamble to, to do this as they were postdocs, um, and they, it really paid off. And then I wanted to thank some of our core team members, Ashley Johnson, Simone Sawyer, Devon Person, and um, Candace Avenin, who really put in a huge amount of effort to making this possible for uh, the communities that we work with. So anything good you hear is definitely from due to one of the, these folks and anything that you hear that's probably a little bit uh, wrong or misguided is definitely my my fault. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how I have this new role and, you know, it's a fancy role with a fancy title, but it, it didn't start that way. Um, this is a picture of me back from when I was a nerdy kid from Idaho in my freshman year at Utah State University. Um, and was just sort of trying to figure things out and didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up, I think like a lot of kids, um, and didn't really know uh, how to get from one place to the other. And so how did it happen that I got from, from where I was to where I am now? And I think it, it, this is an instructive exercise that was a thing that Shannon and Abuzar and I sat down and did right at the beginning when we were thinking about Data Trail, which is we wanted to sort of understand what are the steps or the or the components of being successful and becoming a data scientist or in your career. And so you have to know that data science or the area is a real thing. You have to have the income security to be able to get the schooling that you need. You need access to an expensive computer. Um, they say a data scientist is a statistician working on a MacBook Pro and a MacBook Pro is pretty expensive. So you need access to it. Um, you need access to appropriate educational programs and instructors the right jobs have to come up at the right times. And then really you have to rely on your community and your network to be able to get connections. And I think 
again, I was really excited to see Peter's description of the job uh, placement and connection services that are sort of being provided by our medicine, because I think that's such an important piece of helping young people get careers. But even more importantly than that, I um, had a number of people that really made the difference for me. My undergraduate advisor, Jim Powell, took a chance on me. My graduate advisor, John Story, worked with me even when I didn't know anything about statistics when I got started. Giovanni Parmigiani rescued me from a difficult situation and, and supported me in a job. And Rafa really helped me, Rafa Rosari helped me really figure out what it means to be a biostatistician and day-to-day uh, -day practice. And then Karen Banding Rose was the first chair that hired me. And the list goes really on and on. There are a whole collection of people that made it possible for me to arrive at the place I am now. And I just wanted to give everybody a brief moment. I know that there's live chat and um, you could put it in chat or you could think to yourself, think about all of the people that helped you get to where you are today, which if you've kind of landed in a place you're happy with, um, what, what was it, who did it take? Who are the community that helped lift you up and get you to that place? And I think if you're anything like me, you'll realize it's a huge community of people that really help uh, get you get you to the place that you're going. So it's really important to build that community for, for other people as you kind of move up in your career. So the whole kind of hypothesis around data trail is that talent is equally distributed. And this is our second cohort of data trail scholars. Um, they all live really close to Johns Hopkins um, where, uh, or did at the time that the program ran um, uh, near where I went to work every day. Um, and they are all fantastic, brilliant young people who are um, now doing either data science or going off to med school or pursuing other careers. And it's really exciting to see what they can accomplish. But a, an important sort of caveat to the talent being equally distributed is that opportunity isn't always equally distributed. So this is data from the Economic Opportunity Atlas. Um, which was pr pr produced by Ray Shetty and folks at Harvard. Um, and they looked at the data from census records and the data from IRS tax records. And they found that for a person that grew up in the neighborhood, I'm highlighting the neighborhood right around Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School, the median family income for a family of a person that grew up in this neighborhood is $18,000 in their mid 30s. So that's kind of a stunning lack of opportunity. And the red sort of indicates the scale of the lack of opportunity. I, I take into calling these opportunity deserts. Um, and you find them all over the United States. Um, I've moved to a place, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, which is in an incredibly wealthy part of Seattle. And in, despite that, there's still this opportunity desert for people that grew up in the neighborhood right around the Fred Hutch. Um, if you grew up in, in this neighborhood, you again have a low median income um, at the age of 35. And it's not just the Hutch and it's not just Hopkins, basically every major medical center, you know, they're often placed in locations of, of need. And when they're placed in those locations, there's often opportunity deserts directly adjacent to those um, communities. Um, and so uh, one of the sort of core reasons we actually started this was thinking about we have this group of talented young people in this opportunity desert, and it's right next to a billion dollar medical center with tons of need for data, every level of data professional. Can we make these two things match up and try to both help um, create economic opportunity, but also solve an, an area of major need for medical centers? And so this isn't just a, a problem of uh, economic inequality, it's also a public health problem. Um, this is another incredible data set out of Ray's group in, at Harvard, and it shows on the x-axis income percentile, so how much money your parents made on a percentile basis. So zero is your parents made very little money, and 100 means your, your parents are very wealthy. And life expectancy is shown on the y-axis for uh, males and females. And you can see that th this is real data, but the linear correlation between income percentile and life expectancy is incredibly tight. Um, correlation doesn't imply causation, but this is such an incredibly compelling correlation that we wondered if you kind of move people from one income quartile to another income quartile, um, will that have a substantive impact on their, you know, not just their economic conditions, but their life expectancy and their health. So what does this have to do with ed education? Um, education is still the best treatment we have for this sort of um, uh, economic and uh, opportunity inequality. Um, I'm showing you here a graph of the different uh, colleges around the United States. On the x-axis is uh, the access rate, so it's how hard you get it. What's the chance that you get into that college 
if you're from the first quintile of income, so the bottom 20% of income. So if the colleges over here on the right are very easy to get into, and these are very hard if you have low uh, income. And on the y-axis is the success rate, is the chance you're in the top quintile of income after you leave that university. And so Johns Hopkins, where I used to work, but also lots of fancy universities are up in this corner where it's very hard to get into them. But even, once you get into them, you'll have a very high chance of having a high income at the end. Um, and there's this kind of L-shaped pattern, which is, you know, the, the ones that are harder to get into typically produce higher incomes after going to those universities. The really interesting thing about these data is that it shows that the income mobility is relatively independent of your parents' income. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing the parents' income quintile. Uh, quantile, so it goes from um, very uh, poor to very wealthy. Um, and then on the y-axis is the quantile of the fraction of the kids in the very top quantile after they finish a university. And I've, it, you know, this comes from the data that they collected. They labeled the universities in these various buckets. And you can see within a bucket, the curve, it does go up a little bit to the right, but it's relatively flat. And so what does that practically mean? It means no matter what quintile your parents' income came from, if you go to this university, you have a very reasonable chance of ending up in a, a pretty well-off situation. So they define something called a mobility rate, which is multiplying the fraction of parents with uh, income in the bottom quintile by the fraction of students that end up, given that they get into that university at the top quintile of income by the age of 34. And they sort of use this as a measure of how well does that college or university move people from the lowest quintile to the highest quintiles of income. And if you look at the top colleges, they tend to be large public schools with high access rates. Um, so you can get into them and they're very large. There's a lot of students that go to them. Um, and they tend to have re really reasonable success rates. Um, but you, when you multiply these two things together, you get a mobility rate that's sort of around 10%, which is um, really good um, by, by national standards. But um, one of the things that's interesting about this is you know, you have this huge collection of people that are studying lots of different things. The chance of them all being very high income is, is relatively low. But if you pick specific areas where there's high income potential at the end, you could imagine increasing that mobility rate. And so data science is one area that we all know is a high growth and wage job category. And, and data science is actually means a lot of different things. I think that we're just at the beginning of defining the spectrum of what it means to be a data scientist, all the way from entry level data processing and, and data entry kind of uh, jobs that are require some thinking, but are just basic jobs, all the way up to very advanced machine learning and complicated modeling. And I think we need to fill that entire gap of, of jobs. And in particular, this is a, a job growth category within the field of medicine. I know here it's true at the Fred Hutch here. It's definitely true um, at Hopkins where I was before that there is a always a shortage of people who can be sort of clinical data managers for groups, manage, whether it's ma managing trials, whether it's managing data from large epidemiological studies. Um, there's a kind of increasing demand for clinical data managers um, in, across the entire biomedical enterprise. I'll come back to this in a minute. We've seen this demand firsthand because we have developed at Johns Hopkins previously, and now we're doing it some here at the Fred Hutch as well, massive online open data science programs that enrolled millions of people all over the country and the world. Um, there's huge enrollment in these programs because there's a lot of interest in getting into these high growth um, job categories. Um, so uh, this is an incredible opportunity to leverage this education to uh, improve uh, mobility rate around the country. So we wanted to study, and this is one of the projects that launched this whole project, or one of the papers that launched this whole project. Abuzar wanted to study if the MOOC programs, if students who took those MOOC programs actually it improved their employment project prospects, it improved their income. And it turns out that MOOCs could, you know, with an analysis that he did, he did this um, quite nice uh, propensity weighted analysis. I, I'm not going to go into the details. You can read it in the paper. But it essentially showed that you get a pretty significant percentage increase in your income just from taking and completing these online courses, which was quite exciting. Um, the challenge, though, is that MOOCs benefit the already well-educated. So these massive online open courses, the sort of hope was that if you build it, they will come. People will just show up, start taking these courses, and will use them to Im improve their uh, life situation the reality of not just our MOOCs, but every data science MOOC or boot camp is that um, the folks that are taking advantage of it are folks that are already well-educated, 
um, already have employment prospects and they're using it to move up in their careers. This is data from our program, but it's reflected in the data. There's been a series of papers that have come out that show that it's it's sort of reflected across the enterprise of data science training, that it benefits the already well-educated. Um, one of the interesting things about our sort of data science courses on Coursera is that it, it, for a long time, the modal user was a white middle-class male software engineer from Silicon Valley. And we definitely want to educate those folks. We think it's really important that everybody gets access to data science education, but it's definitely not leveling the playing field or distributing opportunity across the entire um, spectrum of people in the United States. So we really wanted to design data trail to see if we could target um, folks who have limited educational background, limited knowledge of data science, and see if we could train them to be very entry level data managers, data analysts, data entry uh, folks, and, and see if we could get them into those kind of employment prospects. And in particular, to connect them to Johns Hopkins, where we were working at the time. Um, and so that was the sort of the goal of the project. But the reality is that there are significant barriers to entry, just as I described at the beginning. You have to know what data science is. You have to have access to an expensive computer and income security and appropriate programs and instruction and the right jobs and connections. And you might not have all of those things if you come from an opportunity desert. But even if you don't come from an opportunity desert, you just have to be lucky and get help and get support and be able to do these sorts of things. And so it's the same set of, you know, it's not unique in, to, the, to those individuals that come from the communities we're trying to support, but it is a challenge for those communities. And we wanted to see if we could systematically address those barriers and knock them down for people. So the first thing is knowing about data science. And so we all know about data science and R and uh, the, way, the ways it can be used and how powerful it is. Um, but when we first started partnering and our first partner was with um, the historic East Baltimore Community Action Coalition in Baltimore, it was right next to Johns Hopkins. They have a youth opportunity training program where they train folks to get their GEDs, um, which is a high school diploma in Maryland. And um, we would go down there and hang out when we were first designing the program and starting to figure it out. We would spend a lot of time down there and we would talk to all the young people and none of them had even heard that data was a thing, data science was a thing. They got, lots of them would get excited about it once we uh, started talking to them about it, but it was sort of a, a new thing. And so just communicating and getting the idea out into different communities about what are the opportunities in different fields that they may or may not have heard about previously was a big thing. We're seeing this now as we do a lot of work with um, uh, co community colleges and tribal colleges, also in rural areas as well. So it's not just in um, cities that this kind of opportunity deserts occur. Near where I grew up in Idaho, there's also a similar sort of opportunity desert just nearby. And so uh, really getting this idea out there is a critical piece of moving people forward. I mentioned that the computers can be pretty expensive, as we all know, that, that you need to use to do data science. And so our entire intention from the beginning was we're going to design a program that you could do on a public library computer or you could do on a Chromebook. This was uh, an intentional design cho choice to make it possible to do the entire program through a web browser. If you had an Internet connection and a web browser, you could do the program. And at the time we first started developing this, that was a little bit hard. Um, since then, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything else, there's been so much development in cloud technologies that um, it's become increasingly easy to, to be a person that just operates in the cloud. At the time, it was our studio cloud, now it's called Posit Cloud. Um, this is an old slide, but this came from the alpha phase of our studio cloud. I reached out to Tarif and, and JJ at our studio. They were working on this our studio cloud project. And they very early on gave us access and a lot of support. Robbie and his team gave us a lot of support there to basically build our entire program on our studio cloud. And we built the entire program there before it was even really launched as a beta project um, because we knew that we needed a tool that would allow us to let people compute on the cloud and not just on their local laptop. And then um, we started thinking about how do you do data science on a Chromebook? And we wanted to sort of eat, use our, you know, eat our own dog food, as they say. And so I, uh, started doing all of my work on a Chromebook. And in fact, I had done that until I moved to the Hutch. I had been on a Chromebook and was issued a Mac sort of against my will. Um, I had been on a Chromebook sort of for the last seven or eight years doing my data science entirely on that. Um, and so it's possible to do it. It's sort of like writing a haiku. Like the first few times you write a haiku poem, it's very uncomfortable to get all the syllables right and get the you know the the design of the poem right but then as you go on you can basically begin to uh, uh, get used to it and then it's a lot easier to do 
So that was the computer and knowing about data science. Then there was income security. And here we really relied on our partners. So the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, the ABLE Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and most recently POSIT have contributed some money to allow us to be able to basically pay people to complete the courses. And so they treat it like a part-time job. This is an absolutely critical piece of the program because a lot of the young people we work with don't have enough income to be able to concentrate on this full time if they can't treat it like a job. And so we've been thinking about ways to basically make it possible for them to focus on this training as a part of their um, you know, income stream so that they can focus on their job. And then they need access to instruction and appropriate programs. And a lot of programs aren't really designed for um, folks who are just coming out of their GED. They're, they're usually designed for more advanced people, uh, educate people at more people who are advanced in their education. And so we needed to design programs that would work there. And so this is where it's really relevant at the R Medicine Conference. We picked R for a very, you know, we had, we thought about Python. There's some real advantages to Python. We thought about, you know, other languages to, to include as well. Um, but R really stuck out. And, and the reason why is we wanted to sort of minimize the time to magic. We've been thinking about how do you quickly, quickly get people to do things that they'll get excited about. And so the code on the left produces the website on the right, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and I just saw the haiku pop up in the chat, which is amazing, by the way. I'm definitely using that. Um, uh, and so the goal was to minimize time to magic. We want to be able to make it possible for people to write a little bit of code and produce a website or write a tiny bit of code and process a gigantic amount of data um, like you can with the big R query package or with you know Flex Dashboard or Shiny. The code on the left produces a full in Haynes interactive uh, dashboard on the right. And so again, it's how fast can you get them to happiness? And the faster you can, the more engaged and more excited they'll be. And R is incredible at that. So we built, and originally it was called cloud-based data science. I'll tell you about the latest iteration in a few minutes. Um, and it really covered everything from how to use the basics, Google and the cloud, how to organize data science projects, version control, R, the sort of general data tidying and data analysis process, and then some, some quote unquote soft skills like written and oral communication and getting a job in data science. And so the idea was really, how do you figure out a way to, to take someone all the way through this life cycle, not just focusing on their technical skills, but focusing on the whole person. And then last was access to connections. We need to be able to get them connections to jobs. And I think this is, again, a place where the R community shines in an incredible way, um, whether it's R Ladies, the Bioconductor Group, R Medicine, Data Carpentry, Openscapes. There's this incredible, supportive, friendly developer community. And I think, um, you know, Hadley and JJ and uh, R Studio and now Posit really deserve a lot of credit, too, because they've sort of pioneered. And Bioconductor is also really big on this. And I mean, all these groups really, Data Carpentry is incredible, so is our ladies, it supporting people and not making them feel dumb when they ask questions and not making them feel silly for wanting to learn how to do things. I've been a part of a lot of technological communities and most of them aren't like that. And I think it's one of, I, if there is a superpower of the R community, it's that it makes new users feel welcome and it makes them want to contribute. And that's like an unbelievable force multiplier across the entire uh, community. So I just really wanted to shout out all of you and everybody else who participates in this because it's really amazing. So um, we actually, I'm gonna tell you about the pilot, but we've had about an 80% success rate at getting people through the training in the pilot. And then I'm gonna tell you about some of the challenges we ran into as well, because the next step is trying to, you know, our original intention was to try to connect them to jobs. But there are some real challenges in making that happen. We've been working with Urban Alliance, and now we're going to be working with an additional other partners to basically help identify job opportunities and make sure that people can take the training that we give them, which is only 14 weeks. It's really introductory. They really need a bunch of on-the-job training to really solidify those skills and start to adapt to the workplace. And so we um, have internships that we place people in immediately upon completing the program. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, our pilot project uh, that we started in Baltimore. This is what it's felt like the entire time that we were doing this project. We've always been feeling like we're sort of fixing a bug in production as we're going in the sense that, you know, there's always something on the train tracks, something we're trying to fix. And usually our solution is something like this, where it's sort of us trying to stop something from going off the rails right before it happens. 
most of the time those are self-inflicted and most of the time they're my fault. And our team has been really good at doing this, knocking the barriers down and getting people off the, off the rails. And so it's been really fantastic to work with my team. Again, you're going to hear about some mistakes we made and those were all my fault. And then you're going to hear about great things. And those are all our team's good doing. So the way this worked was in 2018, Shannon, Abuzar, and I started thinking about this and we went down, we started building a little bit of a data science program that might be focused on this sort of community, uh, the community of people who haven't really been impl implicated or involved in our uh, in data science to start. In April, we had our first meeting with Yo and Hebcac and we were excited and they were excited and they said, can we start the program immediately? Like, can we start it today? And we were like, well, we don't really have a program yet. And we managed to convince them to wait until May 21st for the learning to start. So that we started in April with the conversations and May 21st, we had to have a program ready for these young people to take. Mind you that we were gonna build this entire program and none of it existed yet at the time that we were talking to people. And so this was me immediately after our meeting with uh, Hebcac stressed trying to figure out how we're going to possibly do this and um again credit to this incredible team the the content actually got built in time for us to run this program and um shannon ellis and abuzar head of end were like by far the leaders on this and deserve huge amounts of credit for the like nights and weekends level effort they put in to make that happen but all these folks contributed content and we basically developed these courses on github we developed them really openly and collaboratively we had a whole sort of procedure that Shannon developed for moving courses along the sort of production cycle. Um, and we were able to sort of build the courses for the for the program. Oops, wait, what happened? I skipped to the wrong place. Sorry, everybody. Let me go back. I don't know what button I pushed. This is the problem with the Mac right here, everybody. So here we go. All right, so the challenge though is a lot of our courses are built on GitHub and a lot of our courses are built on modern open source technologies. This is both awesome because we can get people to magic very quickly. It's also very scary because things can change really quickly. An example of this is we developed a getting and cleaning data course. This is not for the data trail program. This is for our previous Coursera courses. This course has over 35,000 repositories that were built on GitHub from this course. So it's a pretty widely subscribed course. I released this course more or less the same day that the dplyr package was some, was released by Hadley. And so um, if you look on the x-axis, these are the number of scripts from our class that use a particular package. And on the y-axis is the number of times we a, a particular library is called. And you can see that like dplyr is the tool you would definitely use in a getting and cleaning data project. And so our class was immediately obsolete like the minute we released it because Hadley released this dplyr package which was like very stressful and we had to redo the whole thing and also amazing because what Hadley released made everything that we were teaching people how to do the old hard way so much easier and so much better to do and so um it's really been an interesting exercise in trying to figure out ways to automate and speed up the development of classes um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that work towards the end of the talk here today so we wanted to build this this program and we wanted to get it done for people, um, which we did. Um, and so then our pilot began on May 21st. And the first question that they asked us was, OK, how long is this program going to take for people to complete? Which is a totally reasonable question to ask and to which we had absolutely no answer because we just built the program last week. And so we have no idea how long it's going to take people to complete the program. Um, we decided it was going to be a part-time program. It was going to do 20 hours. We were going to have them do 20 hours a week of work for which we could pay them. And we said, I think it's going to take about three months. That was a number that was totally made up. Um, and we had two pilot uh, folks that did the program with us, two young people. They were like astronauts landing on the moon. They had to deal with us updating the projects all the time and updating the courses all the time. They had to deal with us being the, our very first time teaching it to this kind of cohort of people. They had to deal with, I mean, just a series of nightmare scenarios. Um, and we had projected that they would finish by August 31st. Again, totally made up number, but it turned out it took until October 5th. A large fraction of that delay was we would get to the point where they were supposed to work on a course and we would realize that course was totally broken and we would have to like delay them a week while we like fixed the course and updated it. And so um, 
it ended up being about 16 weeks for them since we've settled on about 14 weeks for the program. So it wasn't a totally terrible estimate that we had, but um, it was sort of uh, a testament to the incredible talent of these two first young people um, who have since gone on to do some pretty incredible things. I'll talk about one of them here in a minute um, that went through this program to start. The challenge that we immediately ran into is we try to get them jobs. And um, anybody who's ever written a job ad or seen a job ad will see, um, will know this story, which is the real responsibility of a data scientist is often to automate some horrible practice that takes everybody a million years to do by hand currently, or, and then to write some ad hoc SQL or tidyverse code as needed to solve problems for people around the place. But the required experience listed will be like 15 years of deep learning experience in Python, a PhD thesis on Bayesian modeling, and, you know, 10 years of creating Hadoop clusters from scratch. And I think that's partially because we're still at the early stages of people understanding what data scientists do. And so they don't really know what experience to list. But the practical implication of this is that most people, most of the jobs that people might apply for or be interested in, they, they feel like they don't have the expertise or they don't have the required levels that will get them past the filters to get them into those jobs. Not only that, but we have a real um, legal challenge as well to the data scientists we're training. So um, I ended up learning a lot about legal uh, definitions of employment um, for this project, which is not a thing a biostatistician usually has to learn about. Um, and the main thing I learned about was the Fair Labor and Standards Act, which um, defines exempt and non-exempt roles. And by exempt, I mean exempt from paying people minimum wage. If you're a salaried worker, you're probably an exempt worker. Um, and so they can pay you a salary, but that means they're exempt from paying you overtime and minimum wage. And there are sort of six categories of people that can be uh, exempt from the law that sets the minimum wage. And so there are people that are managers, people that have advanced degrees, people that are uh, artists, people that are computer programmers. Um, and it turns out that data scientist doesn't quite meet the definition of any of the exemption categories um, unless they have a bachelor's degree. That Then they qualify for the advanced degree uh, exemption. And so um, the folks that we're training have to be hourly employees. So there aren't a ton of data scientist jobs that are hourly employee jobs, including at the time there were like zero jobs that you could apply for at Johns Hopkins that were hourly, that were data scientist job, even for entry level data entry data jobs, they were all exempt employees. And so universities couldn't hire them um, without some changes. And so we went and looked into this. We talked to many, many lawyers to try to figure out how do we actually design the program? And it turns out that what we needed to do is really work with employers to figure out a way to not work, not to, you know, bucket hole them into a particular, or button hole them into a particular exemption, but rather to um, figure out a way to create new kinds of jobs that are available to these people. So we were this close. And again, we're doing this all on the fly. And we have two people that are about to finish the program and I don't have a job for them. So I did what any you know, normal person would do, and I started a company. And so what I did was I reached out to my friend, Jamie McGovern, who is the husband of Rebecca Nugent, who's a, quite a friendly a friend of mine and a, a well-known statistician. She's the chair of the Carnegie Mellon Stats Department. They're really close family friends. And Jamie is a really well-known consultant. And so he founded this data science consulting company with me called Problem Forward Data Science. And we would take consulting work from a variety of different high profile clients around the country. And we, we would have most of the work done by consultants who we hired from this data science training program. So we could give them their first data science opportunity. And they were hourly employees with uh, overtime and um, so that we could really focus on um, providing that first foot in the door opportunity for people. While that was going on, we started working on the thing that we really wanted to do, which is get them jobs at Hopkins because Hopkins is right next door to where we were training people. Um, and has a lot more opportunity than I can generate in a little startup company. And so we worked for a year, and this is really credit to Ashley Johnson, who was our program administrator. She really moved this through the system, um, working closely with the HR department at Johns Hopkins, but they invented a whole new job code specifically for data scientists, programmer and data specialists, who are non-exempt employees, they're hourly employees, and they can work at any of the campuses around Johns Hopkins. This was a huge effort and a really important contribution from Ashley because it allowed us to start to hire our data analysts and data scientists at Johns Hopkins. And we now have hired several of them at Hopkins, which is really exciting. 
This template also provides a way for, if you wanna create such a job category at your institution, it's sort of a model and a template and you can point at Hopkins as a place that's already done it um, if you wanna to try to create these kind of opportunities where you're at. So the interesting thing about this is we had to deal with data science problems and community um, uh, relationship building problems and course development problems and uh, HR problems, all the problems really. Um, and we had this phrase that we like to use all the time, Shannon and Abuzar and I, uh, when we were working on this project, we said, hard things are hard to do. If you really wanna do something important and you really wanna make a big change, it's often gonna be hard and it is gonna be a hard thing to do. And so um, again, I'd like to just give you a little brief moment, whether you wanted to drop it in chat, or think about it um, you know, quietly to yourself. Think about something that was hard that you accomplished. Um, I think it's good to take a minute to reflect on the really hard things that you've done that have made a difference for people in the world, in particular in helping other people. And um, so I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to think about that and to reflect on um, how much you're capable of if you really put your mind to it. I think one of the things this project has illustrated for me is how much if we really put our mind to it, we can do incredible things for the community and for the world. And so um, I'm sure you're all doing the same and I want you to take a chance to sort of pat yourself on the back and think about something hard you accomplished. Great. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the impact that this program has had um, next. Um, and so the, the program has had a pretty significant um, impact on the young people that we worked with. And I think that that has been the most rewarding part of this. I mean, there's been all sorts of fun parts of it, but the first is that we hired, so using that job code that Ashley created, we were able to hire one of our, I think it was cohort three uh, graduates, Davon Person, uh, to be the curriculum lead for Data Trail. So he's currently working at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, he mentors students through our training program, and he helps design and build our curriculum with um, Candace Savinen. Um, so it's been really amazing to see the development of Dayon. Um, we knew that he wanted to, that he we wanted him to be the curriculum lead when we would have these parties at our house um, in Baltimore for all of the scholars and all of the staff, and we would have kind of a barbecue in our backyard. And Davon would come and he would spend the whole time hanging out with my son, teaching him how to play chess. And my son would like eat this up. And Davon was an incredible teacher. And we just realized he's the kind of person that could really help our program and to really develop the, the um, young people that were, were part of our um, uh, ecosystem. And so we really have appreciated him. And he was the first pilot candidate that got hired under our new data science hiring program at, at Johns Hopkins since there've been others. And then another incredible uh, outcome of this is one of the young people who was part of our very first cohort of data trail scholars was working at that company, Problem Forward, that we founded. And one of the contracts that that company had was, was to analyze data for HBO. And when we were analyzing data for this HBO um, special, um, they analyzed data about um, economic opportunity and particularly the redlining that has happened historically in Baltimore and how the historic redlining of communities in Baltimore has carried through through 60 plus years and has set the um, geographic stage for um, housing prices and housing quality and housing support in the in the Baltimore area. And um, basically what our um, young person from our program was actually credited in the, the so the manager, Jamie McGovern, who is the sort of co uh, 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 mentor, and then um, our uh, one of our first two data trail scholars actually appeared in the credits of the of the uh, HBO documentary. It's called The Slow Hustle, and you should definitely check it out if you uh, have want something to do this evening. The other thing that was really great, and we're working on a paper that we're going to publish about this, but um, by Simone Sawyer, who is our community scholar advocate, is really talking to our young people and asking them about what the program meant to them and what it what it did and didn't do for them. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting is it said, as this is a quote from one of our scholars, it gave me a new direction and taught me that you can be different, go a different route than your parents, not always hanging on to what society tells you, you can follow your own protocol. So it just gave me a sense of like a new world or a new field and new life that I got to see. And it's been incredibly exciting to see our young people thrive that have come out of the program. Not all of them actually go on to be data scientists. Some of them go on to different jobs. 
Um, they go on to different careers. They're, you know, when you were 18, you probably didn't know exactly what you wanted to do. I know I didn't. Um, so sometimes they stay in the field and sometimes they don't. But I, regardless, it's been so fun to see how this program has helped be a stepping stone for them to whatever it is that they want to take on uh, post-program. Um, it's just been a really fantastic, uh, pow powerful uh, component of the program to have this community of scholars that's been developing. We've learned some pretty important lessons as we were doing this. Um, it was definitely an exercise in running through walls and, and learning how to do things. Uh, you know, I'm a biostatistician by training. This was my first community-based project, so I had a lot to learn. And the good news is I had really great mentors and teachers and our nonprofit partners who helped us learn how to do things well, but, but there were still a lot of things we had to learn. One of the things that was an immediately apparent from the first cohort and has been true throughout the entire sort of experience of, of working on data trail has been that data science training is actually the easiest part. Um, so, you know, the, the young people that we're working with, they're young people, they're like good with computers. They know how to pick, they pick this stuff up fast. They're like, often they end up teaching us about part packages we've never heard about and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, but we really need to be able to support the whole person for them to be able to go through the program, especially when you're working with communities where there isn't a lot of economic opportunity and there's a lot of economic stressors and financial stressors and so forth. Um, you really need ways to support the whole person. And so whether that's providing laptops, whether it's creating connections to the community for mentors, whether it's paying them to complete courses so they can focus on it as a full-time job, whether it's providing online support and job search assistance. We've also had to realize that we needed to hire a community scholar advocate within our organization. And their whole job is just making sure the young people have what they need, that they're housed, that they have access to food, that they have access to income, that they have access to a bus pass when they need to get somewhere. Um, and we've been able to that keep people in the program, I think, largely by virtue of not just thinking of it as a data science training program, but as a whole person support infrastructure to try to help them get through this training. And building trust takes a lot of time. So um, when we first started going down to, to meet with folks at the Yo Center, in fact, we actually approached 20 other nonprofits about whether we would whether they would work with us, whether they would uh, do this training program with us. And we were frequently turned away because we weren't, we hadn't built up any trust. We didn't have any credibility. It really took the HEBCAC folks taking a flyer on us for us to be able to work on this program. And the thing that we learned right from the start is that, you know, being there is the most important thing. And so we started to spend a lot of time down at the Historic East Baltimore Community Action Coalition and starting just being present, being there. All of our training didn't happen at Hopkins. We would like go to the HEBCAC to be able to train people so that we were like present there. And despite all of that, I think we built some trust over time, but I think the thing that has maximized the trust building has been Davon. So really it's about, it, you know, this is a person that came from their community that they trust and know that they've, he's been a, a member of their community. And he can talk about his experience of going through the program, getting a job, being a leader now for us. And I think that's produced a lot of value for our uh, or our relationship with not just the nonprofits, but also with the young people that we work with. It's really thinking about how do you develop those connections and how do you develop that relationship, um, which has been so incredibly meaningful and important for this project. And then we need advocates. So one of the things that's really interesting about this project is thinking about okay, you're going to take a young person, you're going to put them through a 14-week data science training program. As you all probably can imagine, given the shortness of that program and, and how little background they had in data science before we started, they're just at the very beginning of their data science career. They, they know a few things, they know a few packages, they can do a little bit of work, but they're not fully formed yet. You know, they're still learning on the job. And so what does that mean? It means we need to identify supportive uh, employment opportunities where the mentors at those employment opportunities understand what kind of community we're working with, understand that this is the beginning of a journey. Think of it as a long-term investment in that employee instead of a short-term return. Um, and that's taken a lot of work and also a lot of work to work with organizations to help them understand what it is that you need to do when you're trying to hire people from these diverse communities, from these economic opportunity deserts. Um, and so we've kind of had to do both. We've worked with the sort of uh, official bureaucratic processes, HR and finance and all that. But we also work very closely with the mentors and the employers to try to help them figure out how do they um, uh, 
uh, work with this. And I, I think we're doing an okay job at this, but we have way more work to do on this side. I think we've devoted a lot of attention to how do we build up the young people and do the data science training. And we're really at the beginning of our journey of how do we actually create a program for people who might hire people from our um, data trail uh, uh, program and how do we get them to understand how it is to interact with these young people um, as well. Um, so then, uh, uh, oh, and there's a good question about evaluation and um, in the in the text here, which is, um, how do we have a structured way to assess barriers and what metrics to assess future program outcomes? Yes. So we're designing the data collection and capture strategy. Um, and we have a lot of uh, educational data about them because all of the methods we use to do the training are high throughput educational methods. We also have access to the APIs to all of the questions they asked and all of that. And then we can collect standard, you know, uh, financial demographic uh, background data as well as um, outcome economic outcome data. One of the things that's really interesting about defining success here is um, what does it mean to be successful out of a program like this? And we don't want it to be that you have to be a working data scientist six months out, a year out, two years out. If a young person, one of the young people in our program is going to college simultaneously, he has an intention of getting a degree and then going to medical school. Um, if he goes and becomes a doctor, that's a totally successful outcome. He won't be a data scientist, but we want that to be considered a success. So I think defining success has been a real challenge for us, actually. And for people who know more about this, again, not my area, main area of expertise, would love to talk to people who have ideas about that. And again, we need mutually intensive learning. So, um, you know, we provided social support, financial support, data science training to the data science learners. But now to the experts, we need to provide, you know, anti-racism training, mentorship training around what it is that we expect from them, some support for HR best practices and so forth. So we have that sort of the right hand side of this is not really built up yet, but definitely needs to be built up for us to be able to be more successful. One of our big learnings is you have to sort of train both sides and both sides have to learn together for this to be a really successful uh, relationship and, and uh, successful mentorship opportunity. So what's the future of uh, data trail? I told you a little bit about the past. Um, the data trail model really is um, a college or university or medical center providing tutors and educational support, um, nonprofit communities providing social and emotional support and financial support, and then hiring partners providing mentors and uh, opportunities. So for example, in the case of the Baltimore data trail program, we have the Johns Hopkins data science lab producing the sort of providing the tutors and the educational support. We have HEBCAC and more recently Heart Smiles being our nonprofit community partners, helping to identify and support young people. And then I'm putting pause it here because they've been an incredibly supportive um, partner in, in supporting some of these young people. Um, but there are a number of other companies and organizations that also have taken on young people and scholars um, out of the data trail program. So you could also get involved in data trail. And, I, and this is the part of the talk I'm most excited about is just as Phil, uh, just as we talked about at the beginning of the sort of uh, presentation, this is a project that's evolving and ongoing, and we would love contributions from anybody. And there's various levels at which you might participate if you're excited about this at all. So first, you could just tell other people about Data Trail. We like want to, we want to get the word out. We want people to know that this is a program that exists and that they can use and they can um, leverage at their institution. Um, you can basically find all of the details about our program at datatrail.org. Um, so if you go and check that out, it has information about our curriculum and the program and the design philosophy and all of that. Um, you can also encourage more inclusive hiring pra practices at your organization. Um, so we have a job description, which we share with anybody that wants to have it, that they can use to try to design similar job descriptions for non-exempt uh, employees at their organizations. This takes a lot of advocacy work, but is um, a really rewarding way to create diversity within your uh, organization. Um, one of the ways that you could help out is recommend data sets for learning examples. I think the R medicine community could be a really incredible resource for this. This is one that we're constantly working on. Our examples are starting to get a little stale from our original program. And so we really would love to have some modern, exciting new medical examples. Um, so the data examples are project templates. Um, there are markdown based. Whenever possible, they either shouldn't require too much background knowledge or you should be able to describe uh, the background knowledge within the context of that R markdown. 
and the data needs to be publicly available or okay to be made so, so that we can share it with people. And then we create data projects on Posit Cloud, which we then share with people so that they can actually work on them and practice their skills. This is such an important part of becoming a data scientist is having those skills to be able to um, uh, practice on projects. So would love to work with any of you if you have any ideas on, on projects. You can um, find uh, our, all of our code on GitHub. So this is the code for the courses. So if you go to github.com slash data trail JHU, data trail itself was taken. So we took data trail JHU um, slash data trail, you will find our entire curriculum. You can also add an issue there or send a pull request if you notice a thing that you want uh, that you want to fix. Um, so it'd be really helpful. Um, and then hosting a data trail graduate as an intern, um, you can either do this with your own funding or uh, with funding that we provide. We've already placed interns at a few different places. Um, these are a couple of examples of the places that we've placed interns out of the program. Um, and what is required, we, we have funding available to pay for some of these interns. Um, if you don't have the funding to pay for one, um, you'd have to have an entry-level data science project that you have in mind. Um, we can help you determine if it's a good fit, but it needs to be pretty basic and pretty introductory. And then some time to mentor the intern. You can meet once or twice a week. You could have the post a postdoc or a senior grad student could be the direct mentor as long as they have some uh, experience mentoring and preferably eight weeks or more in duration so they can really get some experience. Ideally with some culminating publication and that could be, and by publication, it could just be a GitHub project that's put up. Um, if you have any interest in this at all, you can email me, jtleek at fredhutch.org or Candace Savinen at, uh, her email is csavinen at fredhutch.org. She's sort of leading a lot of the data science, uh, data trail program at this point with me from the Fred Hutch side um, and could uh, connect you to potential projects that you might uh, do if you were hosting an intern. And then you could create an extension course. And so this is where I'm really excited about our medicine and the potentials here. I've talked to several different groups about this. And so far the project hasn't really got off the ground. So this is me um, doing a, a you know, uh, throwing this out into the world and hoping the universe will uh, respond. We would really love to tailor an add-on course or an elective course that's focused on clinical data management. Um, you can find all of our content online of what's on our original program here at this URL. Um, and um, I can also paste it. Somebody can paste it in the chat, chat maybe for me if, that, if they uh, get a chance. Um, and so you can go read what they actually learned uh, previously and what they would have ha already had experience in, but we don't really focus on clinical data. We don't focus on red cap. We don't focus on any of the things that a clinical data manager might be interested in, but we would really love to add an add-on course so we can focus on that sort of area of data science. Um, and if anybody's even remotely interested in collaborating, I hope they will reach out to me about that. Um, you can see the self-taught version of our courses on LeanPub. We've put them up there so that they can be available for free. You can pay a suggested price, but it's more like a donation than a payment because you can tune the slider down to zero so anybody can take the course and get a credential, a data trail credential um, from taking the course. Um, and then we have a whole infrastructure for designing these courses and releasing them on LeanPub and Coursera and on the public web. It's called Otter Project. You can go to otterproject.org. So if you decide that you have any interest in working with us on a clinical data management course, we can collaborate via this Otter project, which is basically a GitHub-based course development uh, framework that's really useful for multiple publications simultaneously. And so finally, the sort of heaviest lift that you could potentially get involved with is starting your own franchise. And so um, we, we have decided that the model for scaling data trail beyond Baltimore is what we're calling a franchise model. And by franchise model, we mean we give you everything that we have um, for free, and then you run your own program if you're interested in running your own program. So uh, this has already been done a couple of times. Um, the, the longest running one is at Mount Sinai Health System is running a data trail program. Um, but we would be very interested in supporting you if you decide that you'd want to run such a program yourself at your institution. Um, if you're going to do that, you need a nonprofit training partner for uh, helping you to identify students from the community and providing that wraparound support. You need funding for some kind of Chromebooks and a stipend, typically on the order of this is now more like four or five K per student. Um, it was three K when we started. Um, and then a team to support the students through the program. That's a program leader. Who's typically somebody who's sort of supervising and managing 
um, typically 10 to 20% effort from two to three tutors to sort of help people uh, do the program. And then you run the cohorts in sort of 14 week cohorts. Um, and then some initial hiring partners, again, ideally eight weeks with significant mentorship. This could be your institution, it could be corporate partners. We've developed a whole collection of materials, course materials, instructor guides, you know, templates for hiring, advice around fundraising, et cetera, that we can provide to anybody that's interested if you have any interest in sort of setting up your own data trail franchise. So if you have any questions about this, um, you can email Candice here at c 7 at fredhutch.org or me at jtleak at fredhutch.org or go check out our website at, at Data Trail. So the, the last thing I'll sort of leave you with is thinking about paying it forward. And I think this is a really useful feeling that I've had, and I, I hope you'll feel the same way about how exciting it can be to pay it forward. Um, the really only way that we can help each other, and Data Trail is just one way we can help each other. I just feel like the R community, and I know the R medicine community, uh, are just so happy to be a part of these communities because they always help each other out. And sometimes it's helping each other out on something like Data Trail, which is a big ongoing project. Sometimes it's just helping each other with a little bit of code. Um, and I think, or mentoring or bring or helping pull up somebody that's behind them on the ladder. Um, and I think, uh, I hope that you will uh, continue to do that because I love being a part of this community that you're all creating. And I wanna continue to be uh, a member of this community. I just wanted to highlight a quote from my advisor, Jim Powell. I, he was my undergrad advisor. And I was a goofy kid from Idaho who had no idea what he wanted to do. And, and Jim took me on and helped me get involved in a couple of research projects. And honestly, I really probably wouldn't have had a career that I've had without Jim's advice. Um, and I emailed him after I finished. Um, actually, it was like right after I won this big stats award, I sent an email to Jim and I was like, just kind of explained how grateful I was for everything that he gave me and, and every, all the support he gave me. And like, how he had no reason to do it other than just being nice and just being a person that likes to help other people. And he wrote back, mentorship is a debt. You don't pay off, you pay it forward. And then he said, thanks for helping me pay off my karmic debt. And so I feel like I'm paying off karmic debt to all the people that uh, helped me along the way. And I know we thought about those people that helped you along the way earlier today and think about that karmic debt. And I hope that you'll continue to be the amazing supportive community of people that helps others that you have been this whole time. And there's almost nothing more rewarding than paying it forward and helping other people to be successful, especially exciting young people who know a lot more than you do and will figure things out you won't be able to figure out. With that, I'll just thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. We have some questions that came in through the chat and we'll start with Jeff Curtis saying this is a tremendous effort. How do you screen people for the program who are serious and will be committed? Some of the typical achievement metrics used for employment evaluation and an, ed and an education may not apply. Yeah, that's an absolutely fantastic question. So the way we've done it is, so we're doing scalable education and really non-scalable uh, community effort work. And so on the education side, we put everything online. We put, you know, we run thousands of people through these courses, but for this program, we work closely with nonprofit partners who have been part of the, the, the young people's training throughout the entire process, and they actually recommend people. So um, rather than having one metric or one screening criteria, which we have found excludes people, like maybe they're bad at testing or maybe they, you know, get anxiety. And so we have found that the best way to identify young people who are committed and will show up is to um, work with the nonprofit partners who've worked with them for years and can easily identify who's going to show up and who's not going to show up, who's going to work hard and who's not going to work hard. So it's, um, I wish I could say it was real quantitative, but it's more, um, you know, uh, deep partnership with the nonprofit partners, relying on their expertise, really. Excellent. Thank you. A question from Hannah Hill. Um, do graduates of the Data Trail course receive a certification? Yes, they do. They they receive a certification um, on LeanPub, which is a massive online open course provider. 
Um, the original CBDS program has a Johns Hopkins logo on it. We're working on getting data trail. So it has a little Johns Hopkins logo on it. It's not an official Johns Hopkins credential. It's a Johns Hopkins massive online open course credential, which is a different thing, but they do get a credential. That's like a diploma that comes out of that. And it's the same one that anybody would get if they took the program for free online by themselves. So that's one interesting design choice that we made is we didn't design a program that only these young people take. Literally thousands of people have taken these these training programs and gotten these same credentials, and it would be indistinguishable whether they went through our training program or whether they did it themselves online. And so we think that improves the value of the credential because it means there are lots of other people, software developers who've taken the training program and have that credential, and then also our young people, and it sort of elevates the value of the, of the credential. So yeah, they get a credential. It's not a full like university degree, one of the things we're working on with another project, we, we work on something called the Genomic Data Science Community Network, and I'll drop that in the chat here, the URL for that. Um, and this is a group of community colleges, HBCUs, tribal colleges, um, who are folk and their faculty, all those places that are focused on data science education. And we've been talking a lot, especially to the community community college groups about creating stackable credentials. So where you could get some community college credit for having completed the data trail program, which would allow them to shorten their time to degree. And, and we do really think that more education is necessary for a lot of our young people. And so how do we shorten that and reduce costs for them by having them get the data trail program? So that's future work too, lots of future work. Another question from Peter, have you started to try to clone this in Seattle? How hard is it to find the community partners and build trust? That is a great question. Yes, we have started to build it in Seattle. We have a couple of philanthropic donors who are interested in supporting it, which is our first step. Um, then we're working with finding community partners right now. I'll tell you, it's gonna be exactly what it was at Hopkins, which is they won't trust me until I've been there for like multiple years and I've shown them that it will work. It's a very, you know, it's like it's uh, like anything, right? You're building a relationship with a group, and we're at the very early stages of trying to build those relationships here, and um, it's going to take some time. But yes, we're building it here. I'm excited to run it here. It's going to be great, but it's going to take a couple of years like it did at Hopkins before I feel like we have really strong relationships with those groups. Because, I mean, in their defense, right, like I'm just showing up out of nowhere to try to do this program with them, they, you know. Who knows if I'm trustworthy or not? But they'll have to verify that I'm trustworthy before we really can get get going with them. And then a related question: um, Do you have some specific examples of that trust building process? Yeah, I mean, there's a variety of them. One is when when you actually place young people in jobs. That's a pretty important. That's a long term trust building thing. But when they see a member of their community, like Davon, goes back now all the time. Um, and he's got a job at Hopkins and it's a really well-paying job and he's doing really well and he gets to go back and tell them that this is a real thing that he did go through our program he did work with us and he did get a job that's a long-term one the the shorter term one for me was actually just spending time I would like sit down at Hebcac and just do my work and just kind of hang out and like um, talk to young people I was you know I looked very different than a lot of the people that were hanging out at Hebcac so like I was a curiosity and <laughs> people would come and talk to me. And um, at first, you know, I was probably distrusted quite a bit. And then I kind of became part of the background. You know, I was down there enough that that they saw me. And I think that just took a while just showing up, being there. Um, and so it is, it's a lot of work. I, I guess I don't want to make it seem like this is a thing you can do really easily. It is a lot of work and you have to care about it a lot if you want to do this kind of program. Um, but it's, for me at least, it's been one of the most positively impactful things I've done in my career, so. And a question about um, being a freelancer, would it be possible to um, start a franchise coming from that perspective? I think so. I mean, we, we're happy to provide the materials to anybody that wants it. Um, it helps a little bit to have some infrastructure and support because you're gonna need to make partnerships with community-based nonprofits and partnerships with employers and things like that. Um, and we can help provide a ton of advice. Um, you might be, it might be easier if you at least have some friends, if you're a freelancer, it's, this would be a very hard thing to do by yourself. I would not recommend it by yourself, but if you had like a little cohort of people that wanted to do something like this, then, then yeah, it could probably work. 
And another question, how hard was it to convince HR to let people hire folks without a college degree? We have trouble doing this for study coordinators. This is from Peter. It was a huge amount of work. <laughs> that was probably one of the hardest things in this whole project. I, I said that as kind of a one slide in many, but that was a, Ashley spent a year talking to doing meetings after meetings after meetings and like showing evidence and you know building the job code for them and all this kind of stuff so um it was a non-trivial operation um we ended we ultimately ended up pulling rank a little bit and getting some senior leadership involved and that helped um but the hr department actually ended up being quite supportive in the end so it was it, at first it was a little frustrating but once we got over that hop, hump it was actually they ended up being a real collaborator with us um so if you can find your people in hr they can help you out and we have a the, the one thing that's an advantage is now we have a job code that's officially listed as a Johns Hopkins job code that has a no degree requirement, and it might be useful. We had to point to other institutions where things like this existed, and so it might be useful for you to point to Hopkins and say this exists there as a way of making inroads um, with your HR department. But yeah, that's another, it just takes work to, to make it happen. Good question, though, Peter. And uh, we'll float this one last question in the interest of time um, from Robbie Nuroko um, in the Q&A. Thank you so much for the talk. My name is Robbie from Ghana. I want to find out, is the program open for someone like me to join? Also, I had my undergraduate studies in nutrition and biochem, and I've been looking for graduate studies opportunities. I'm a very good in interning as a data uh, analyst currently. One barrier I face in my applications is that I have to have a statistics or mathematics background to pursue bio data science related course. How can I get around this? Yeah, so I mean, um, this is a fantastic question and I really appreciate it. And so our program, the, the the full wraparound program that we run currently only runs in cities in the US that we are talking to a, a group in Nigeria about running it and a group in Ghana about running it, but that hasn't actually gotten off the ground yet. Um, uh, and then, uh, so, so it doesn't exist. I don't think it's the full wraparound program. That being said, all of the courses that we offer are 100% free and online. And so you can go start doing them today. There's no prerequisites, no background required. If you just go start the courses, you can start them right now. Um, you, the, but we don't have the sort of wraparound services for you yet. But I think that's something for us to think about is how do we make it more global as we go? So um, so the, the good news is there's no barriers to entry. The bad news is you're kind of, it's not like you're on your own, but it's a little bit less um, wraparound support services to take these courses at this time. Um, and that might help you with your background because um, you, you'll at least have some R programming background. There's a little bit of statistics in the in the program as well, like some linear modeling and things. So you would, you would get some of that background um, from taking the course. And there's no mathematical prerequisites other than, you know, basic um, uh, math, algebra, and things like that. Excellent. Jeff, thank you so much again. Um, fantastic yeah. talk. If there are additional questions, please feel free to continue the discussion in the chat, but we'll go ahead and um, move on to our next speaker. So next